Hi, Manesh. It's good to see you. My friend, thank you for joining me for another episode of the Transformation by Design podcast. How is your day going on so far? How are you feeling? Yeah, it's going very well. It's very nice to see you, Martin. Thank you for having me on your podcast. Uh, yeah, I've had a very long week, but very good week and uh, enjoying the end of Friday. <laughs> this is the last thing before going and enjoying the weekend. So happy to be here. Wonderful. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad to have you. So grateful to have you. And I know our audience is going to enjoy what you have to share with us because Manesh is an amazingly unique man. He's a leading shaman, uh, lives in Europe and helps high-end folks to really tap into their spiritual side and unlock their infinite potential. He is a spiritual guide that helps others to really realize what is behind the darkness and the unknown and step into the unknown with a lot more confidence and certainty of what there awaits them. So we have a wonderful guest with us today that's going to share with us some uh, unique insights that you'd be pressed to find in other places. So let's begin the podcast with the first fundamental question. What got you into shamanism and helping others through this process of transformation and spiritual guidance and so on? What was your journey into it? Yeah, my, um, my journey was random and coincidental and, uh, and divinely intervened as my ego was going into the full headstrong ego trip of wanting to be a rock star, of course, uh, or a sport athlete star. And uh, both of those experiences brought me a lot into what I would call now flow states. And uh, at one point, when I was 14 years old uh, with my band touring in uh, different boarding schools on the East Coast, I went and walked into the forest and had a, a near-death experience that was really powerful and uh, popped me out of my body, made me enter into this other state of consciousness where I melded into nature and uh, heard the spirits of the birds, of the worms, of the trees, of the ecosystem and the complete melding of realities and uh and had a mystical experience with this my own shadow which actually sang to me and actually came back into me to then bring me back into life and uh and then go back to the concert and had normal <laughs> duties of being a rock star and uh, that definitely intrigued me, even though it also created some pain where I got made fun of uh, from being Manny Mohawk and like all sorts of stuff, like, you know, because I saw a bunch of, of Native American things. Um, but it was very sacred land, as I found out later. And uh, this guy actually told us, you know, not to come back there, but that I was a medicine man. And that's why I was able to penetrate into this sacred land that was protected by him. Um, and later on, about two years later, I actually met uh, two of my first teachers, Archie Firelandir, who is a Lakota Sioux um, spiritual guide and, uh, and uh, holy man, and uh, Jackie Bailey in France, who's a Druid medicine man, holy man. Both of them have passed now. Um, but so those two I met. Uh, back in 1993, 92, something like that. Um, and they started initiating me into shaman, shamanic practices, uh, the Lakota pipe and uh, Buffalo woman practice uh, and lineage. And, um, and yeah, I mean, music really brought me into it. I'd say perhaps at seven, getting kicked out of the church for laughing at the priest at the sermon that probably got me into it. Um, and even as a kid, I had some weird aspects of, um, you know, being kind of a bully's bully. So anybody who was bullying anybody else unfairly, I'd, I'd use my strength to bully them, you know, even if they were five, 10 years older than me and really kind of give them conscious lessons about 
not doing that. I would call my parents' friends at five years old to have a discussion with them, you know, about things rather than calling the kid that I should have been playing with. So I think from an early age, I, I was a little bit uh, touched by something. Um, and uh, yeah, <laughs> it's a weird, uh, weird way. Like, I mean, for me, like, as I said, my ego had this idea of what I was going to be doing. And uh, very quickly, I learned to let go and actually stop willfully manifesting any noise because that wasn't my essence. It was what my will wanted, what my imagination of the distorted personality that I actually had created from childhood wounding of not receiving recognition, of not receiving love, of not receiving, even though my family was great and, and we were called the Brady Bunch, um, you know, it was, it was, uh, your family always has your teachings and therefore kind of creates wounding uh, and creates your personality, so your false personality. And so that I had to deconstruct for a very long time. Uh, and that was part of the initiations. It took 13 different masters to really pop me. <laughs> and then uh, and then nature, I would say nature is calling. I was fascinated by nature, like ever since I could walk and always close to animals, uh, always listen to it and uh and the spirits and always believed in a higher power before even understanding what that really meant and always praying even as a two three year old it was funny i was very bald when i was a kid till about four and so i looked like a little buddhist monk uh for quite a long time and uh big eyes still so it was interesting Wonderful, yeah. It's, it's, it seems like it, uh, or sounds like a typical indigo child, if you're uh, familiar with this uh, concept. Yeah, for sure. I I've been called that very much. Yeah, interesting, very interesting journey. So can you tell us more about your teachers, the, your mentors, the, the, the men that are women, or the folks who got you into that journey and that you learned the most out of, and what were these main and substantial lessons you learned from them? going into the shamanic world and so on. Yeah, I think, um, I think uh, it's amazing, you know, that phrase of when the student is ready, the teacher comes is really pertinent to me. And it was really how things came to me. Um, as I said, my first teacher was uh, Archie Fire Lamdeer from the Lakota and Jackie Bailey, um, this Druid lineage and plant medicine men, both of them. Um, I learned the sweat lodge uh, from both of them. So started doing a lot of sweat lodges at state 16. And, and basically I was pouring and got my water rights by the age of 2021 20, um, from different dreams. And plus having done already a lot of sweat lodges and then um, different teachers just, just kept coming, whether it was from college or from friends or whatever, um, different teachers just showed up. Even one time this, this flyer came slapping me in the face in New York in a wind tunnel. Uh, and literally like I pull it out. And before all day, I was thinking about the five elements and how the five elements are really the grand masters because above that you have the Trinity, which is very abstract or duality or unity, single kind of consciousness levels. And so the five elements are kind of like this, this, practical way of being able to connect to a very high frequency and like this flyer slaps on and it's a tibetan buddhist shamanic bun master who happens to be you know at uh, uh what's that place called uh the open center in new york downtown and he was giving a free lecture literally in five minutes and i was around the corner and i was like well okay i gotta go and then he became one of my teachers. Um, and on his, one of his retreats, a soul retrieval retreat in Colorado, Crestone, he was going back on the temple as we, we did this incredible offering uh, to the elements of the mountain and, and all the spirits. And I said, forget it, I'm staying on the mountain. This is my temple. And this guy taps on my shoulder and that was John Milton, who then I became apprentice of for 13 years. It was like, did you say nature was your temple? And I was like, yep. 
like, do you want to experience real magic nature? I was like, yep. <laughs> Come this way. Okay, I'm following a crazy man. I might go die, you know. But you just follow it because you feel that pull of destiny basically calling you to reach that next level, to learn that deeper thing, to take you deeper. And then, um, yeah, I mean, there was a... Uh, my psychic clairvoyance popped open and that was Jill Lee. Uh, she's out in California, but she was in Maine and, and she's an incredible psychic and energy healer that taught me a massive amount about the astral uh, mechanics basically and, and the whole chakras. And, and then that was phenomenal. I also learned from uh, Rainbow Weaver, which is an Algonquin uh, New York tribe, kind of Northeast tribe woman who uh, taught me also, again, the sweat lodge. She, she added a couple of things in the feminine sense and uh, drumming as well and lots of teachings. Let's see who else. I mean, then after that, it just kind of came. I mean, uh, Charles Lawrence was a great influence, brought me to the Naraya dance, which is incredible. Uh, and I still participate in that with John Milton and also Archie. Uh, I did a lot of ceremonies and then... Um, I like to, we had some really nice conversations with Robert White Mountain, uh, another Lakota, uh, somewhat spiritual warrior. And uh, yeah, and on and on, Shoshone, um, Bear, Shaman, <laughs> uh, Pete, Yellow John, really good. Um, studied with him for a while. And then the plant medicines from South America as well. Um, with uh, Maria Cristina and uh, Guillermo and, uh, and a bunch of others. Uh, and then some of the Keros knowledge as well as I really went into the South America. So I kind of got this very broad um, teaching. And one of the, I would call him more of a teacher brother because we both taught to each other, but we really had a an amazing friendship and, and we walked together healing others and having a practice and then even healing together others and, and doing all sorts of experiments. Um, that was Shed Le, who um, is a Vietnamese French shaman and we hung out here in the Southwest of France. And I, I, I did some pretty amazing growth with him. Um, on all sorts of things. And, uh, and so that's, that's kind of my run. Afterwards, I think direct experiences, like getting hit by lightning, doing, you know, 44 days of vision quest, uh, doing the work. I mean, doing 13 years of vision quests, you know, and going every year back into the hole with yourself and nothing, um, working on that ego a lot. And then, of course, like seeing people, being at service and, and allowing life to come and give the different clients the different wounds so it's a long long answer but i think that's probably the fullest that somebody's gotten <laughs> yeah no absolutely it's wonderful like you have all these different backgrounds of knowledge and all these uh, different modalities and teachers that you've been able to find to organize all this knowledge and experience and so on which is so unique and when you said yeah. vision vision uh Quest. West, what, what do you mean by this? Can you just can you tell us more, a little bit more? So traditionally in the White Buffalo tradition, which is the Lakota spiritual passage of the seven rites, one of the rites is a vision quest. So there's the, the to get the pipe, there's the pipe ceremony, there's the uh, sweat lodge, I mean, there's the sun dance, the women rites, etc. And And one of them, is the vision quest and the vision quest is basically going into nature for an extended amount of time blocking yourself into kind of a medicine wheel so a pretty tight space some people you bury yourself in that in a hole so you don't move for four days you usually fast you don't sleep you don't eat you don't drink and uh, for four days and four nights you just basically are praying uh, purging and and going into a whole other state of being uh which is this pure essence of finding your vision of yourself your frequency your resonance in a way and so i did a lot of those um at one point i was doing two a year 
and uh, and then I ended up doing 44 days. So the 44 days, John Milton has a bit of a different evolved modern way of doing it where there's a little bit more comfort. You can drink water. He even allows some food. Um, you can have a tent, but actually then you do more practice, more Dzogchen practice, which is a Tibetan high transformative rainbow light body kind of um, path, uh, which works with the bun Tibetan shamanic path into transcendence basically in, in deep tantra but it's called Dzogchen and um, and so he added a lot more practice <clears throat> to that ritual and then I've kind of created the wisdom quest which is taking some of those teachings some of my own experiences adding uh, you know the sweat lodge which was usually always there with the Lakotas and then I'm adding the plant medicine afterwards. So you really have this bomb of a, of a reset of getting deep, deep, deep into your core. And before that, I use a couple of systems, uh, including one that I made to analyze your subconscious and your energetic and your spiritual essence through systems that reveal it. And, and so you don't have to go guess too much. It's more about accepting and then maneuvering in the best possible potential way wonderful uh, that sounds fascinating like all, all these things i'm so curious about i'm like wow <laughs> i'm curious it's just uh, you know this has been one of my <clears throat> where i am today all this curiosity for all these things that you know the senses dies the senses and so on that we used to make sense of the world cannot really give us a clear understanding of because they are very limited in their scope and what would you Completely. say? I mean, the, the vision quest on top of it was an initiation that really happened around the world around 14 to make boys into men, to make women into uh, girls into women. So it was face yourself with God, face yourself with nature, basically, and, and realize wh what are you here for? And, and so you have to give up everything. You go up with nothing and then you come back with a vision of what you're here for in terms of your purpose and, and what makes you the most happy. And then the whole community gives you everything for you to be able to do that, which is quite a beautiful thing, which in a way bar mitzvahs and communion and, and things like that in Christianity was, except now we don't do the work. We just get the gifts. Yeah, no, this in, I, so we I, lack yeah. deep initiative. Yeah, no, I, I've uh, studied some of the work of Joseph, Joseph Campbell. Yeah. He's done a lot of research into those different tribes. Yeah, this definitely the initiation has always been a part of human society and all these rituals of bringing one from from into adulthood and becoming acquainted with their true self again and going through this experience. The the dark night of the soul, as some people refer to, or having similar experience to where the ego dies, or at least you experience the ego dead in some way, right? That would be another way to put it. But yeah, this is something that definitely has been lost in our modern society, which is all about consumerism and convenience and comfort. And obviously, none of those rights are about <laughs> any of those things. So. Yeah. It's very hard. That's to... all feeding. That's all feeding the ego, right? No. That's just feeding the distractions of the ego's need to separate from soul. Yeah, yeah. Empty, yeah. empty manifestation of capitalism. Yeah. Yeah, empty pursuits. Yeah. So, what would you say were the main or the most valuable lessons you learned from your from your main mentors and teachers so far? What are these fundamental things that really like wow that really clicked for you when you learned about them or you were introduced to? I think fundamentally, it's how much we don't know. I mean, I think I know a lot, but I really don't know shit. And the more that I get to know, the more. <laughs> I realize how much there is just more and, and it's just unfathomable. And I think allowing yourself to be surprised, allowing yourself to be curious, allowing yourself to be passionately curious and staying open is probably one of the greatest lessons I've learned, which also keeps you very humble. You know, I mean, I've had shitloads of experiences and so compared to some people who are beginning, I can feel like I'm, I'm getting to be old and and very experienced but then i remember my teachers and i'm like no i don't know shit 
but but like you you you're just kind of going through the, the the process right and and it's amazing because then in that there's also the great gift of of giving the space to the other also so for for the younger one to come in to itself you know the younger guide and spiritual teacher that wants to like emerge and and having that um that yeah confidence trust innate faith in the fact that it's all in divine order and and therefore even though he could be or she could be challenging you know you're doing the same to somebody elder and so it's just like actually you're just part of a whole chain and playing the different roles and really like playing those roles out so knowing what your role is and being able to play it fully rather than being confused and doing something totally outside yourself that's also been very valuable so those three things you know very very uh powerful uh teachings there but i mean the, the, there's so many lessons i mean the humbling you know getting grounded and and not letting the ego take over um through pride through whatever guilt through rigidity we were talking about that you know like one of the greatest things when you observe nature and you spend so much time for example there when we were talking about rigidity like everything that's alive in nature and young is supple it's moving, it's very fluid, right? In the wind, in the elements, it's resistant because of that. Anything that's dead is rigid. Everything that's, you know, gone, it's like there's no more life. It's hard and it's rigid, except for maybe metal and stone, which you could argue is still very alive, but um, maybe not in the metal. Anyway, so, you know, lessons from animals and then from different experience. I mean, getting hit by lightning, that's a magical experience. And I, you know, what do you learn from that? I don't know. <laughs> Enlightenment. <laughs> and it's <laughs> literally, <yeah. laughs> and it, and it passes, you know, and then it goes through you. And I mean, um, there's a lot, there's a lot of teachings. The, the teachers, what's amazing with them is, is their generosity and giving. Uh, I think that's, and and being in service really you know like the, the the real dedication to serve humanity to serve the other and to have that generosity to put their own desires needs and things in in second place for some time for considerable amount of time to give to the other so that the other can advance you know i think that's a it's a beautiful dignified noble way of being no, absolutely. I think you were, we were talking about this earlier. This, this misconception that you always have to like, kind of like take or when you like, because again, the world we live in based on trade and sales and so on, you like, you give something and you get something in return. So you always, there's this misconception that you always have to re receive the, the, what comes to you in return from the person to you, who you give to, where the reality yeah. is always energy exchange that is taking place. And if you're coming from a service, as you said, from a this genuine desire to serve others, if you give energy out, which is what you do by serving others, the energy will have to flow back into you. It's a natural law of the universe of balance that keeps yeah. things in balance. You just don't have to expect it from the same place. Maybe it will come in, in, a, in a very unexpected way, but if you open to it and again, yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with this. And also with keeping yourself curious about things. I mean, I'm the same way. The more I learn, and this is something I do on a daily basis, this is a daily routine for me to learn something new. And you always like, the more you learn, the more you realize how on the intellectual level, how much we don't understand. And we would yeah. never, because that's the limitation. The intellect is the limitation. If we are to really develop or tap into this intuitive feeling we can know everything without even knowing about it without yeah. learning just by that yeah. how it works which is Completely. Enough. yeah i mean the mind is interesting because it's also where the imagination can create infinitely and so it's it's unlimited when you allow it to be but we're very scared of that because 
if we allow the mind to really go to its edge, it's, it's psychotic, it's crazy. It talks to other voices that, aren't other, that other people don't hear. It talks to and sees potentially other things that are not visible to the real world, right? And yet that's exactly where magic resides. And that's exactly where wonder and inspiration and you know the 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 crazy genius it's all there it's all on that edge of the mind where the psychedelics take you and 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 beyond that even you know so where the shamanic state where the ecstasy takes you where the sexual orgasm where that drive to like you know seek something that is exciting all of that is is in that border of the mind and it's exactly what needs to be not only explored deeply you have to go through it to find a whole other level of awareness and consciousness. And so the limits of the mind are fascinating and the rigidity of consciousness by programming of conditioning is incredible. I mean, we're living in a time where we all know that within three months of fear, we can be programmed. <clears throat> well, guess what? We just got programmed. Oh, yeah. And look at the entire mass of consciousness as become asleep like there's a lot of people that were kind of waking up and whoop, they just went right back closed doors you know and they're like no no thank you scared fear and literally have lowered in consciousness it's it's actually frightening and beautiful at the same time to see how sharp that system is, is. in three months you can reprogram you know humanity and how tight they have the system whoever's programming it down but it's also um amazing to watch that it is systematic you know oh, yeah. our whole consciousness is systematic so are we living in a hologram our brain is tapped into the hologram making the hologram getting fed by the hologram and you know that's why birthday systems and this and that all work because there is actually a simulation hologram but that's that's intense, you know. Like the 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 when you you go into deep shamanism, and you love nature and animals, and because you have this very emotional connection to their teachings, to their beauty, to their but they're actually a hologram. We're in a simulation. We're, we're, there is nothing that's organic in a sense. Like organic, what? Like it, we were all consciousness, and then triggers of emotions of a nervous system. It's fascinating, right? And then yet we're living these real experiences that we say is real. Is it? <laughs> is it? Yes, yeah, a good question, right? Is it? Well, we're definitely never going to know it while we're living it. Because the way I see it is, is again, if you're not going in through these, as you said, what it, it, what it really is, is letting go of the desire for control of this need for certainty and being able to surrender yourself into a deep experience like as you said with the plant medicine or whatever the kind of the shortcut is for someone who hasn't been in deeply meditating for long years and putting themselves in those experiences to be able to tap into an experience and just get a taste of, of what this could be or and just again surrender this desire to control and let it be yeah exactly go through the experience is what is really stopping us. And that's why the system that you mentioned right now, the system of fear is so effective because nobody's willing to let go of this desire for control because we still programmed since early childhood to be in survival mode, to be surviving, surviving of the fittest rather than thriving. Because every time we connect to those lower emotions, they're all animalistic in the sense they're part of the body. They're yeah. not ours, but we, yeah. because we don't have, or a lot of us lack the distinction between me, myself, my body, and my mind, we associate and take on these as being us, where they're just the, the software of the body telling you, oh, maybe this is not a good idea. <laughs> okay, exactly, exactly. I mean, the whole exploration of your body and realizing your machine is, is one of the expertise that I try to teach people. Because once you understand, first of all, your machine, then your software can run a lot more fluidly, right? And then from that software, you can start programming yourself to 
evolve the software to then understand how you can even evolve the machine's use. And that's real biohacking in a sense. And, and, and is that correct? Absolutely. I mean, that is the only thing we're doing here is to grow into our own hacking system of ourselves if we can. I mean, one of my teachers was Jackie always said, you know, if you can do anything, get the fuck out of this solar system as quickly as possible. Like just get out, like enjoy your life, but get out when you die, get out like propulsion, you know, rockets, put the nuclear on and get out of the solar system and then see what is the solar system like. So from being very, very far from it, can you actually even see it? Once we're in it, we're in it. And then, as you said, we're, we're just, it's very difficult to take and remove ourselves. And it's, it's even questionable as whether you should. I mean, an athlete is in the flow. He's in the moment, he's in the performance, he's in the divine form in motion, right? That's performance. And so we, we aim to be in that flow as much as possible in that flow state. Um, psychedelics, meditations, laughter, taking risks, you know, like it, it, it requires all these states of being in comfort, but yet being risky, being safe, but not, you know, being fearful, but being in love, being open and surrendering, but being completely focused and strategic. It's like, it's, it's the juxtaposition that starts vibrating this thing that then all of a sudden makes miracles, literally. And, and, and things happen and you don't know how it happened. You could, we, we, we don't have the, the consciousness of how, but it, we, we can get to it, you know, through the passionate experience of being in the body, which is quite interesting because a lot of our spiritual teachings teach us to get out of the body, that we are soul. But like, actually, we have to bring soul into the body. So we're not body, we're not materia. Materia is a hologram, but it's in the materia that we're playing the game. So we have to remember what our soul is. We have to remember what our body is, and then like start being, you know, professionals at being us, masters. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. And the more embodied you are, the more the spirit that can inhabit the suit is what I call the space suit. The space suit. Um, it's not a very evolved space suit, by the way. It's pretty amazing, but it's not that evolved. <laughs> yeah, yeah. From a conscious perspective, yeah, absolutely. I agree. Definitely. There's a lot of room for improvement, for sure. <laughs> There's a lot of room. We're like at Windows 95, right? And it's like, you know, we don't have too many plugins yet. The body is just not plugged into the internet, barely. Yeah. <laughs> well, here again, it's, it's, it's going to be a challenge going into the, the new, whatever new is going to be from here on, because our life is at this point is all, or the society is structured about consumerism and convenience. And with those two things driving the main needs and desires of people, and then it's not going to be, or, or this is going to be only on the fringes like me, you and others that are kind of pushing the limits of the technology and finding what is it capable of because it's infinite in its capacity. It's created by divine force. So it has infinite capacity to expand to whatever you can imagine, right? Starting with the, with the software running it and so on. So completely. There's always going to be somebody like us playing with that field, but I don't think there's going to be mainstream unless it becomes that simple for everyone to tap into it, kind of like plant medicine or something like that, just to have the experience. Yeah. I mean, plant medicine is, is, a, is a pretty incredible thing. And the fact that these plants are making these chemicals that actually run in the software and upgrade software and hardware right? But they have no use for, for those chemicals themselves. They're just literally making it to create a connection with the mammals. And it's not just us that, that they receive, like deers, bunnies, foxes, all trip out on mushrooms, for example. And, and, uh, mush and uh, hunters and gatherers, if we go into that theory, uh, you know, and, and monkeys definitely eat mushrooms, you know. It's and most likely eight psychedelic mushrooms that helped actually advance the consciousness, just like fruit and uh, the fructose helped grow the brain. So did the psychedelics that opens up connections that we're now finally discovering with more science. And I think some of those uh, psychedelic plants have always been sacred and always reserved 
to a certain degree to the shaman, which continuously used these plants as master plants to keep evolving his software or her software. And uh, it's only recent, you know, like maybe since the 60s, 50s, that the person also used some of these psychedelic plants, like ayahuasca and things. Before that, it was the shaman that went into that world, saw what he needed to heal the body of the other. But because we're so starved because of our the hijacking that's happened with Christianity of spirituality in, I would say, the Western world, we, we've forgotten the essence of spiritual practice. You know, like real spiritual practice is, is pushing our limits. And I think most of Christianity was founded on shamanic practices that use psychedelics. And so they kept it for their own, you know, top priests and, and banned it from the, the poor uh, to create class segregation that went with scarcity, which is the basics of control. And it's to conquer, you have to divide. So divide them through consciousness, right? And so it is like this deep war of consciousness when meditations, even science at one point was considered, you know, against the church, therefore bad. Now it's become the church and it's like the new church. And if the science says yes, then we can do it. You know, it's like, but we still have government that's trying to like do that. And then the morals of our Christian thinking or religious thinkings also put limitations in thinking that a plant is going to evolve us. And it's not a shortcut. It's not a cheat code. It's actually a instrumental piece of feeding the software that needs to be done a lot, especially today where we're evolving rapidly into a whole new way with AI rapidly taking over a certain aspects. We need to evolve our brain into a much more continuous uh, state of these higher states of consciousness that meditation or plants can give us. And we need to really get there a lot more than this very superficial conscious consumerism uh, is bringing us because otherwise we won't survive. There, there's a huge amounts of networks that are about to break down, right? No, absolutely, absolutely. but. Again, this is our, what I like to call art school, and we're here to learn individually as a whole kind of like collection of consciousness that's here in this school learning, <laughs> kind of like in uh, pretty much kindergarten here still on the mass level. <laughs> that's yeah, For sure, for sure. But we can still play. I mean, it's a, it's a very fun place to play. Oh no, absolutely. That's, that's exactly how I see it. It's an amazing playground that we come to play and it's all about collaborating and making it more fun because that's how games become more fun to play rather exactly. than having this separation. And that's why me and folks like you and everyone that's serving others to really transform and step into a deeper place and understanding of what this game is all about is so powerful because then we can all play rather than being separated by all these differences that are all just here they don't exist really they just we hold them as true these beliefs and ideas and mindsets or whatever programming software you want to call it right all these limitations because it's all always here nowhere else it's all psychological exactly. all the time 100 percent exactly what would you say was the most important lesson that you most important lesson that you had to learn up to this point in your journey in shamanism and so on on personal growth i think it's really coming to terms that uh you know your free will is extremely limited and that uh you you surrender to your destiny and the faster you do that the faster you are able to enjoy yourself as soon as you aren't surrendered, you're creating pain bodies, you're creating distortion fields, you're creating uh, karma, you're creating unresolved consciousness, basically, um, and hooks from triggers, hooks from, you know, your old wounds. So, yeah, that surrendering to the fact that we don't have so much free will. And yet, in that there's so much beauty 
the free will is that you surrender. Like that's our free will. <laughs> or not. And then you create havoc, basically. So I think that's one of the biggest lessons. And in that, you serve. You, you, you surrender to serve what life wants out of you rather than what you want out of life. It's a whole different perception field that creates new opportunities, new functioning, new time, new space, and new realizations, actually. And the potential, therefore, manifesting becomes way bigger because it bypasses the limits of the ego mind. Now, that's wonderful that you're sharing this. I actually, what I like to expand on this idea, for example, a great man that many even scientific people would admire was Einstein. And Einstein asked, said that the most important question that a human being can ask themselves throughout their life is, are we living in a friendly universe? Because if your answer is yes, it's a benevolent universe, then you can surrender because you know it has your back. And it, it is a lot more intelligent because it's infinite intelligence to make good choices on your behalf. <laughs> in yeah. the sense of like the journey that you should take on or you should allow to be and you should flow with rather than try to force it because in in eastern philosophy or through you know in meditative uh, states and so on you realize that all pain and suffering is all self-help because you're unwilling to accept things the way they are and you're trying to force your like little model of the world your rigid box to fit things into the box and obviously <laughs> the more you exactly. do exactly the more frustrated exactly. you get and so on so it's all self-help it's exactly whether it's good or bad that's the most important part and even that's a questionable aspect i mean that's just plus okay. and minus yeah. that's just you know, it's the ping pong of the, the match of life charging itself. So yeah. the more extremes you can go, the more charge you actually have to play with for transcendence. Uh, and, and so, you know, your ego trying to control things and retain it into a small box makes you actually lose a lot of that charge. And, and then you get depressed because you can't activate stuff. So again, you know, allowing yourself to sway through and, and, and whatever your fear is, you have to go through it. It's, it's, it's not a, an option. You're not going to like, I mean, you can wait and wait and wait, but like, you know, life's waiting and eternally more patient than you. So at one point or another, it's just going to grab you and throw you through the door, you know, <laughs> and it'll be more violent than if you had just walked in. That's, that's funny that you say this because I, I like to explain it the same way. Like life, the lessons they, they we, her, we are here in art school and it's not a choice. The only choice you have is, is it either you're going to learn through pain and suffering or through insight and wisdom, which is a proactive act of learning and growing rather than waiting because yeah, it starts to knock first. It's a little knock, then it's a little knock and then, eventually gets to the point where it punches you so hard in the face that you don't know what happened. <laughs> exactly. A hundred percent. In the ever escalating feedback loop. Exactly. Wonderful. Wonderful. I'm glad that we're vibing and resonating on these ideas. What was the most powerful program or in your case, obviously was this uh, exposure to shamanic and the spiritual teachers that have been, like I would imagine, especially the Native Americans and so on. This is something that you're not going to find online or something like that. It's yeah. an experience. So what was the most like, dramatic or like transformative of those experiences you went through? And what was, what was your main takeaway from you, from them? Because yours are quite unique. So I would love to hear about them. I mean, so many. Um, I, I, I definitely, I'll, I'll, I'll use a course and I'll use a physical shamanic experience. Um, I mean, besides the vision quest, which I talked about, I think one of the most powerful um, seminars I did was the soul retrieval with uh, Tenzin Rengyal Rinpoche, who I think still does them in Creston here and there. And it was amazing because the ritual itself was very graceful and very beautiful up in the mountain, burning, you know, praying, doing movements, calling in spirits and releasing, putting intentions like very soft, very beautiful 
two weeks later, super violent, super powerful vision, woke up in the middle of the night, you know, like with tens and, and 75 screens all going at the same time in like a yogic form. And that was incredible power. You know, it was just power of, of, of the magic of what spiritual teaching can be, where you teach through dreams and it can be very real. And I, I remember after the whole experience that must have lasted 20 minutes, waking me up at three in the morning, bent backwards and seeing visions and him explaining all of the soul pieces that he's bringing back into my body at that moment to make me feel complete and throughout space and time. Yeah, that's mind blowing that you can like all of a sudden open up all of space and time and all merge it back into a moment. And it's pretty incredible of your whole being. Uh, through psychic connections, through the dream space, through the physical body being woken and brought into a certain pain body suffering so that the experience is very powerful and remarkable, meaning like it marks you. And it did, it marked me for life. Like I remember that experience. Uh, seeing a yeti and encountering a yeti in uh, a bigfoot in a vision quest that scared the shit out of me that was remarkable and that taught me uh, that there's magic beings that exist that are way higher consciousness than us and that science has not really uh discovered all of life yet on this earth so that's a, that was that was a mind-blowing one and uh and of course getting hit by lightning it was remarkable as well, where you really get to understand. Like, I mean, I saw two lightning bolts come. So there's one from the earth, one from the sky. And if that gum at the exact same time, I would have been fried. But because they had a delay, I wasn't. And therefore, I was initiated and that it talked. So in that, there's a consciousness that is there of everything that vibrates, that is life. And in that you can connect to everything and really start having a dialogue and that building relationship with, with each thing, the water, the river, the fire, the wood, the tree, you know, the grass. What, what is the relationship you're building with those elements that is actually a construct of your own relationship with yourself? Those things, uh, those three were phenomenal experiences and programs that really changed me and brought, you know, the soul retrieval, amazing technology of self-learning through time and space. Uh, the Yeti, a magical creature that's not supposed to be here that taught me tremendous things, but especially fear and the, the power of fear, but also the transmission of higher consciousness and um, the lightning which is like that the elements have consciousness and can speak to all of us. And so all of those together, you know, trusting the communication with the material and the spiritual. Wonderful. Yeah, definitely quite, quite a unique experience. I must say, yeah, we all have, uh, I guess we all have magic moments in life. It's just are we open to seeing them or not? The signs are always there. Hundred percent. I mean, I think that's probably what happened with me. You know, I went through a depression from eight to twelve by moving from France to the U.S., and so that was pretty intense. Um, and that I think opened up weird aspects where I went on this trip when I was twelve uh, in. Uh, the Toronto lakes up in the, the North Bay and uh, we went canoeing. And so there was this weird connection to that Native American life. But actually something happened with the, the teachers and, and the group of the kids that had to like bond together against the teachers and this and that. And um, that awoken something in me back again of allowing magical moments to come into my life. Because at that point it was survival. And then the next year, like around 14, 13, so 14, I have this crazy out of body experience. And then it's just more like, wow, it exists. Therefore, let it come to you, let it arrive, be open for it. And then 
yeah, I've just had so many now. It's almost like kind of ridiculous. Every time I talk, I mean, it's like my list of incredible experiences, but I, I really work on being open to it. That's the thing. And then it shows up. Yeah, I think this is, uh, this is a major one, being open to it. And maybe a, a spiritual awakening experience might be something else, just being open, being open in general to engage with whatever, the, again, the infinite intelligence has, has in mind or in store for you as part of your journey of growth and, and unfoldment because it's always happening. The more you resist it, obviously, the more suffering and pain life would have to serve you with in order to awake you from your egocentric dreams. 100%. And, uh, and I think you had a question before of what, you know, uh, what was challenging in, in being a teacher and a mentor for others and, and what contributed to that uh, path in the most significant way that could help me in growing. And I, I would say there's one thing is having confidence in your intuition. You, you, if, if the person has come to you, you're the right person that can actually do the job if you listen and then trust what you hear. Like we all have it. I mean, one of the things that I did with Shed is we would take the same client. We would, you know, shut up and ask them to shut up and just silently we went into it different things and, and we were both very good at that. So both very psychic. And so he would see things, I would see things. And what we wanted to see was, did my psychic skills see something different that I would suggest to the client than his? Or did the client request from whoever the same thing because that's what they needed to go through? And so the latter was what became the truth. So our interpretation of what we saw or how we saw stuff was maybe different, but it always led us to the exact same thing, which is that the client needs this. So the client is asking you to resolve what their issue is. But it's not what they say. You have to learn to listen to their intuition. I call that the red flag. Whatever they're saying, you know, it's like they're waving it over here and they're like, this is my problem, this is my problem. And then the problem is like over here, back there. Like, ah, no, it's over here. And so that's, that's the, the, the trick is to go see what is behind. What's in the back that's maybe creating this thing and then listen to your intuition because you're going to start feeling in your body. You're going to start getting the information just by sitting there and tuning in. And there, you, you actually have the answer because that's why they came to you. And so usually on top of it, that helps you in some way realize something in your own life. And so giving yourself to service to others, you can't, there's, you know, yes, making money with programs and this and that is really important. And that's probably what I would tell my younger self, you know, like make it a business and be a fucking businessman about the whole thing, not just a healer and like an artist that just like lets shit happen. Because I went in with that wonder and I didn't, like I came from the corporate life, so I wanted to reject the corporate life and go into more of the artistic artist free flow life. But actually that's irresponsible, like making it a business is very responsible and it actually honors you more and most of my teachers you know like it wasn't a business for them and like they didn't yet it was and the people that actually were more successful treated with respect in the fact that it was a business and made it because of that versus not but giving coaching or, or one-to-one -one and always having that even though it's not the, the best business, let's say, um, expandability, like, you know, it doesn't scale. <laughs> yeah, that is so important because that teaches everything. That teaches you the human qualities. That teaches you the subconscious. And then you start seeing once you have a thousand clients. You start seeing the human profile. You start seeing the human essence. You start seeing the commonalities. You start seeing the human issues, right? And, and, and then you get to see from the different success stories, all sorts of different things that work 
for different people, which then you become a very wise person to guide others because of the experience of the other. It's actually kind of interesting. And then you gain from that also for your own life. It's almost like you get so nourished by the other. So I think for somebody, make a business, but always have a certain time for one-on-one -on -one coaching because that's where you learn the most for yourself and to help the other more so than any seminar any podcast or anything it's in the action that you actually learn how to love the other how to love yourself and how to raise your awareness through that loving that's wonderful thank you for for sharing this Ed. absolutely absolutely i totally agree and it's uh, it's always comes down to chunking it at a higher level of consciousness because we're all here for that and at a certain level, you realize that there is no me, there is no you, there is just I, is the I or the me or whatever. So when you help someone, you're literally helping yourself, you're doing something for yourself. It just appears to be someone different to our perception of what reality is. It's, it's just, it's, it's mind boggling, like when you get to that level. Where you, I guess one wanted to just expand on what you were saying earlier with, uh, listening or hearing or trusting your intuition is to actually notice not necessarily the symptoms because the person usually comes with their symptom like my symptom is the problem let's deal with this kind of like the pharmaceutical approach like let's try to suppress all the symptoms but we're not still dealing with the causality here right it's all exactly. about finding the cause and what exactly. you were saying with, to, to, to finish off with is like once you start to work with so many people, you get to see the patterns and you can easily spot and using your intuition and also the, the experience you have, you can easily start to pinpoint what the actual cause is for those symptoms. So you know where to go rather than kind of like trying to open the menu and exactly. figure it out from A to Z. 100%. I mean, I, I was lucky to have a certain system of, of being able to see the aura, the chakras, seeing the links and the cords that are attached to the chakras, the programs, the belief systems, the karma that's all in the aura. And, and I give a course, it's called Clear Essence Meditations, uh, which teaches you that whole system. And, and I think for most healers or mentors or coaches or doctors, people who are helping the other, if you can awaken that and actually just learn the language of it, it's very easy to practice because it's an innate gift that we all have. It's just that we need to be taught. You know, it's just like reading is very easy once you've been taught. So seeing energy is very easy and, and being able to maneuver energy, first of all, by seeing helps you hear what the other person is going through because the symptoms of the rash on the elbow and why it's on the left one and this and that, well, you start seeing, oh, well, your second chakra is fucked. And so is your, like, you know, ego chakra. Well, like, look at that. It's always a pattern when they have a rash, but it doesn't matter where it is. The rash of where it is is actually indicating who they have a problem with in their relationship with their ego and their emotion and their sexual energy. And so, okay, like, what is that? Well, there's an emotional protection that's being created by having the rash, right? Okay, well, why? Why would the ego? Well, because the ego is not creating that barrier. Oh, wow, that's interesting. So the ego is actually interested. Yeah, yeah, the ego is very interesting to create barriers, to create limits, to protect yourself, also to will things into action. But always, you know, it's kind of like the dog on a leash that you have to, to, to train. Like, that's the ego, you know. The, the little puppy dog is fucking adorable, but you leave it by itself, it'll destroy your house in 10 minutes. <laughs> destroy it. And then he'll look at you like, what? I'm cute you know like that's our ego we're like oh, oh shit a little kid you know and 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 so it needs stuff and you got to give it to it and it needs energy it needs love it needs but but i think we try to kill it so much when actually it's extremely useful and it has the capacity to wise up and i'd say so you know the, the energetic system is great and then learning a system a wisdom system like human design, astrology, you know, uh, Enneagrams, my system that I've created, the Sphinx code, which uses the tarot to map out the subconscious, is super, super time efficient to get to helping the other in what they're going through. 
which you can then see energetically. And then the symptom, it, it actually goes away very quickly afterwards. Yeah, yeah. I guess. Absolutely. That's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. And this is always listen to your intuition. Always listen to that first thing. Like, uh, I feel that. And then your mind doubts. Like, shut that thing. Listen to the first thing. Yeah, that's that's what I've been hearing a lot from a uh, spiritual teacher. So always listen to that first urge, whatever, however it shows up, either in, you feel it in your body, you're hearing in your head, right? Because intuition can show up in various ways. And uh, yes. the more we train it, the more we can use all of them. But we all have it. It's an innate feeling. It's, I mean, it's an innate sense, an innate ability. That's why we actually have the senses. They're based on the intuitive ability to actually sense things. A hundred percent. Exactly. And as like, it's funny that you say that you use this uh, description of the ego, but that's how I like to describe it as well. Like, unless you sit down and put the time to meditate or train your mind, which would be the the simplest way to put the ego or what the ego is it's your mind's process i describe it as a little puppy that likes to piss and shit wherever it likes exactly but and chew like, on every piece of furniture that's very nice yeah oh yeah absolutely but it's very it's an extremely powerful and useful too once you it, it becomes your servant not the master exactly that's another part of the process that we all have to go through and uh it's definitely worth investing the time into because it's wonderful when you have trained your puppy to do the things you wanted to do and it's serving you rather than its own little world that's that's i think where the mastership begins you know it's when you're using your ego to serve your soul's higher purpose in usually a creative service way to bring creative imagination inspiration spirit into matter and that is the the i mean in tarot it's a lover's card which is love healing you know medicine art creativity it's all of that but it needs to be centered it needs centering into the heart and making things from the heart and not from the mind yeah, yeah, we always have choices. And so we always have decisions to make. And whether we do the decisions from our heart, which keeps us centered, grounded into our soul, or from the mind and the ego's triggers and traps is really our, our, our only choice. It's come back into your heart to make that choice, that decision. And as soon as you're doing that from almost like the body's perspective, with consciousness and awareness of alignment, then you know of your frequency your unique frequency which is your soul vibe then you're on par you're on brand you're on you know resonance you're in alignment yeah yeah no absolutely it's it's fundamental the co coherence alignment between the heart and mind and it's always coming from the heart place when we make decisions and so on is fundamental because it's very easy using language and so on uh, for the mind or the ego to convince us to buy into things that are not necessarily ideal for the big picture of our soul's desire and our mission here on this, this game of life so it's always great to to reconnect and that's part of the process of the transformational process that a lot of a lot of humanity still has to go through 100 percent. to come from this place of from being heart-centered and always coming from this place of kindness, compassion, giving, serving, loving, being joyful, and this enjoying that rare opportunity we have in this reincarnation to all play together in this game of life and this wonderful times that we are, you know, easier than ever, more, most abundant than ever and stuff, and just so many opportunities for, to seize upon and take advantage of. Thank you so much, Manesh. For You're welcome, Martin. It's a pleasure. Always uh, very good to talk to you. I hope that helped somebody somewhere, I'm sure. Uh, and uh, yeah, I wish you good luck. Sending you many blessings. And uh, let's have another discussion sometime soon.
Sure, sure, absolutely. I'm sure that this information will fall into the right ears or will just trigger the, the exact insights that somebody needs to have in that very moment because that's what usually what happens. As you said, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And it's actually, this works both ways, right? When the teacher is ready, the student will present themselves as well. So that's a wonderful thing. And thank you, our wonderful audience, for tuning in again for another great episode with some unique insights today with Manesh sharing with us all the, those things. Can, how can people find more about you and your work and so on and connect with you? So the best is uh, my site, maneshebar.com, which is M-A-N-E-X-I-B-A-R.com. Otherwise, at Solvana, I have some teachings there. You can type in Claire Essence and Google, uh, and then the frequency uh, dot life uh, essential oil line is a good one um, but mostly on my site it navigates to everything that I have and uh, obviously it's always a work in progress right? sure sure like everything else right so you said you just just to clarify you recommended earlier this program that helps people to read others energy to have a better idea of where they at and what's going on for them can you uh, again repeat the name of the program and give the details yes. it's a uh, clair essence so c-l-a-i-r-e-s-s-e-n-c-e -E -S -S -E, clair essence meditations and there's a there's a site and it's also on a program on teachable and uh, I don't think it's quite on Solvana yet, but it will be eventually. Okay, wonderful, wonderful, because I can see this being very powerful for somebody who, who work. I mean, they're all, all the programs, I would imagine, all the products and programs you have are powerful and useful, but this one coming from a place of willing to serve and being able to know what's present for someone at this moment, it would be a very powerful tool. So thank you for sharing this. And again, for all of the insights, it was wonderful to have this show with you. And uh, I, I know we can be fighting and going on for, for a long time on all these topics and we can take all these different little pathways and stumble into something else. But again, to be respectful of your time, thank you so much, Manish. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's been a great- You're welcome great pleasure and we i'm sure that everyone was able to learn some very valuable insights that are quite unique excellent it is my wish and thank you so much with blessings with blessings yes thank you my friend thank you <laughs>